Um, I noticed that Ms. Bobert, the proponent of this bill, is that correct? That she is not present in the room to speak about her bill. So, um, you know, I would say that I am present and here and very consistently present and um, concerned about passing my bills. So I'm certain the people of Clifton, Colorado um, would like to see this land exchange, this land purchase, excuse me, um, proceed so that they can get those 31.1 acres um, from Mesa County. Um, but I am happy to talk about why I think it's important that those folks in Colorado also have the water that they need to be able to thrive in Mesa County. I have visited that area. It's on the western slope of the Rockies, um, and it is a dry area that depends for its water, both for agriculture and for living for the Colorado River Basin, um, which is why I think it would be appropriate to advance the Basin Reclamation um, Study Program um, at, and to make sure that that program does not expire in September, um, as is expected. Thank you very much, and I yield back. Thanks. I'd like to start by recognizing a Postal Service letter carrier in my district named B. Lee. For 38 years, B. has connected constituents to their essential medicines, ballots, notes from loved ones. With so many hospitals and medical offices on her route, she is proud that her work helps keep our communities healthy and safe. As we discuss ways to improve the federal workforce, I want us all to remember that federal employees are dedicated public servants and valued members of our communities. I thank my constituent B for her years of service to Orange County. Second, I want to take up a partial response to what my colleague um, Ms. Bobert was discussing. Um, VPN, she mentioned an article alleging that 25% of HHS employees did not actually telework, and I just want to flag for everyone here that VPN um, and using VPN login as a way to measure employee engagement and productivity is notoriously inaccurate and misleading. It does not necessarily reflect an employee's access to their email, the internet, they can be working on Microsoft Word, drafting a document, they can be in Excel, inputting data without being connected to the internet at all, much less to VPN. It also fails to reflect the work of the thousands of doctors, researchers, scientists, and other HHS employees who spend much of their time working in the field, not logged onto a computer. Um, I now like to turn to um, an area that I've worked on before, which is- Would, uh, would my colleague just real quick re-yield? Real quick? Yeah. I'm, I'm not even sure if VPN is required, Correct. by the way. Thank you. Correct. Um, I want to turn to an issue I've worked on before, which is wildland firefighter classification. Um, we know that wildfire in California get worse and worse, worse each year. We don't even talk about a season anymore. It's, a, it's an all year round risk. Um, and we owe our wildland firefighters debts of gratitude for what they do. Um, Director, would you agree that achieving um, equity across the wildland firefighter workforce is an important goal? Absolutely, Congresswoman. So we should expect that wildland firefighters who do the same work to have the same job descriptions, pay, benefits, et cetera. Would you agree? Yes, I would. Okay, so as you know, the bipartisan infrastructure law directed coordination between OPM and the Departments of Interior and Agriculture on developing a distinct job series for federal wildland firefighters. And the goal here is to accurately describe their duties and what they should be paid for the hard work that they do. Last June, OPM issued guidance for developing this job series, which includes employees in the Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, Fish and Wildlife, Bureau of Indian Affairs, and National Park Service, five agencies. Um, is OPM facilitating interagency coordination on this classification process to make sure that it's completed properly and fairly? Thank you, Congresswoman. We are. We helped with the, like you mentioned, the, the job series, and now we're working through the classification uh, the occupation series and now working through the classification aspect of it. And you feel that OPM is hands, would you characterize your role here as hands on in helping the agencies come to consistent descriptions? Absolutely. We do see that as our role to ensure continuity. We also want to make sure that we see as our role to ensure that there's, there's a career path and trajectory 
for firefighters. Wonderful, because we don't want the US, fires, U.S. Forest Service to end up short of people because BLM has a different classification. We want all of these agencies to have the ability to have trained and skilled wildland firefighters to keep us all safe. Um, can you talk a little bit about whether you have worked with federal wildland firefighters directly to get their input um, to make sure that what the agencies are doing, what those in Washington or field offices might be doing, matches what's happening on the ground, the challenges that our firefighters Fighters are facing. Absolutely, Congresswoman. We have a uh, what I would hope is a good relationship uh, with the associations and unions that um, support the firefighters. I had the opportunity to meet them in person and hear firsthand about just some really challenging stories about how they're managing just their livelihood uh, with the current pay. And so we want to ensure, as a part of our role, not only this occupation, but uh, to ensure that the pay is a permanent feature. Uh, that's now through the BIL, but will expire soon. Wonderful. I just want to encourage OPM to continue taking a leadership role so that we don't have agencies acting kind of independently and leave the wildland firefighters with the short end of the stick here. Um, the, I want to use my remaining time. Um, has OPM, we hear so much about the costs of federal employees, the costs of their wages, the costs of their benefits. Has OPM formerly studied the costs of recruiting and training for when employees leave? Can we weigh the, the cost of paying an existing, trained, qualified, excellent employee, which we hear a lot about, what does it cost us when that person leaves to get, the, to get a new person and to train them to the same level? Absolutely, there are significant costs when it comes to recruitment and also retention, the knowledge that you've lost and getting that person up to speed, Congresswoman. I do know that there have been a documentation at individual agencies. I'd have to check to see if our agency has done something across government. I would really encourage that as a way of making sure we have all of the data so that we can come to the, the right conclusions as we think about workforce issues. So I would encourage you to think about how to make that more of an initiative and how to coordinate that data across agencies. I thank Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman and um, yield back. Lady yields back. Chair, Mr. Burleson from Missouri for five minutes. Thank you. First, I want to say you look very healthy for someone that was up until 3 a.m. last night. <laughs> Um, well, uh, thank you, Director, for coming. I wanted to say um, it's clear from this hearing. Dr. Rajkapal, first, can you straighten your microphone out? Let me just be very clear. Bend it like this so it's dead straight towards your mouth. Thank you. As far as I can tell, and I'm really on the struggle bus here, what Republicans seem to want is they don't want companies or investment managers to use ESG. Why? Ask them. I don't know. I would, I would imagine, uh, as I said earlier, you know, if, 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 if there are signals that inform your view of future cash flows and risks as a fiduciary, you would actually fail in your responsibility if you didn't look at those signals. Right, so I mean, investment managers have fiduciary duties to make good investments. If they find ESG useful, then they find ESG useful. And if you disagree with them, and you think they're mismanaging your money, sue them. What am I missing here? Or short the stock. You don't even have to sue them, right? I mean, if you have a view that just short the stock, make money. You can be an activist, right? That's how capital markets work, and that's where the discipline comes from. Right. So, I, I mean, I just, I'm really struggling here to understand what Republicans want to have happen. Are they, from your understanding here, it seems like what they want is they want companies to do things that they like. I, too, by the way, would like companies to do things that I like. And I sometimes choose to invest in companies whose practices I like more. But Ms. McLean, my colleague on the other side of the aisle, is saying that if companies want to use ESG, they should be free to do it. Did you hear her say that? I thought so, yeah. Then what is the point of this hearing? I too, I'm with Ms. McLean. I think companies should be free to decide for themselves whether ESG 
practices are beneficial to their bottom line and their business model and help them attract customers or don't. I too think that asset managers should be free to decide that ESG data helps them make good valuation decisions and good investment decisions. And if they don't, they should be able to ignore it. I honestly, this, I can't believe this is part two of what, when part one was actually the stupidest hearing I've ever been to, and now we're having a part two. Please, God, let there not be a part three. Dr. Ragnarpal, is it better for pension fund managers to have more options for investing people's retirement savings, or is it better if they have fewer options? More, obviously. What is a pension fund manager's primary responsibility? To make sure that they can deliver a return commensurate with the uh, pension benefits that have actually been promised to their workers. Great. Will limiting pension fund fund managers' investment options increase retirement savings? Not that I can think of. But that's ex and by the way, you are not just thinking about it. The Kansas Division of Budget did a study. They found that limiting pension fund managers' investment options would cost the retirement system $3.6 billion in reduced returns over 10 years. When we cut off companies and asset managers from choices, investors lose money. We are sacrificing the freedom to invest, and we are all poorer. We're poorer because we have fewer choices, and we're literally poorer because we have lower returns. In 2021, the Texas state government passed a law prohibiting municipalities from signing loans with banks that they believe boycott fossil fuel companies, I believe also guns. Is it better for municipalities to have more options for loans or fewer options for loans? It's a simple supply-demand kind of issue. If you cut off a few suppliers of a product or a service, and if demand stays constant, the price of that good or service goes up. Thank you. I yield back.